Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our event of Meet the Young Professional. And today we are extremely fortunate to have with us uh, Dr. Raisul Islam as our speaker. So as you probably know already, Raisul completed his BSc and MSc Engineering from Buet and PhD in Tripoli uh, e from Stanford University. And he won the university gold medal from Buet for getting the highest CGPA of his batch. And he was one of the first uh, person to get admitted into Stanford from Buet uh, to do his PhD. He's currently working on uh, the material science division of Merck, uh, Dermhurst, uh, Germany. So for uh, uh, with this, I would like to invite Raisul to share his talk on uh, today. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Let me share my slides. Um, Right. Um, I hope everyone can see it. Oh, thank you, Sajid, and uh, for this um, gracious introduction. And uh, I'm happy to be here uh, to talk about uh, talk a little bit about my research. Um, so I um, uh, before before diving deep into the technical part, I wanted to give a little bit of a background of what uh, Mark does and what EMD performance material does. Um, so Mark originally is a, f uh, is a, is a pharmaceutical company uh, founded in um, 1600s actually, 350 years ago. And over the time uh, in Germany, it, was, it started as a small pharmacy in Germany. And um, over time it grew and it uh, spanned across three different businesses. One is pharmaceuticals, of course. Uh, they make dr drugs. And uh, the other, one, other two are, one is life sciences, which is basically all the equipment for uh, different types of diagnostics, uh, drug development, um, um, laboratories for biological life sciences uh, side. And then the third one is performance materials. So performance materials meaning uh, Historically, they were in the business of uh, LCD, liquid crystal display. So they were one of the pioneers in um, LCD. And so recently they, they started looking towards the semiconductor industry. And so they recently acquired two, uh, two companies. One is in the Silicon Valley called Intermolecular. That's where I am. And um, so now Intermolecular is part of uh, Mark. And, um, and they also have bought one more uh, that's called Varsum Materials, um, which is also a, a, a big supplier for the semiconductor industry. So uh, the reason that I go by the name EMD Performance Materials is that there is one other mark um, that is based off in the USA. Um, so Mark cannot use their name Mark in the US and Canada. Outside US and Canada, they use Mark. All right, so with that, I would like to start my uh, talk. And uh, today, my talk is actually going to be divided into two parts. Uh, the first part I would be talking about actually uh, the general landscape of the memory uh, in the post Moore's era. And the second part, I would be briefly discussing about one project that I've, I've worked um, and uh, uh, I've worked re uh, related to that part. So, uh, uh, and, and uh, you are welcome to ask questions. Um, in, in the middle, I'm looking at the chat window. Um, if I find it, it's better to be answered towards the end, I would, uh, uh, I would I would not answer it, uh, but uh, don't don't think that I'm I'm not seeing the seeing the question. So I'll be answering it. All right. So uh, let's uh, let's look at uh, where we are today. So we live in the age of data. So it is expected that uh, that by the year 2025, uh, the amount of data in the world would be more than 150 zettabytes. And um, 
the volume of the data is huge now, but the data has, uh, has always been, uh, been there since the beginning of the, the, the computing era, right? Uh, because computers were designed to actually crunch numbers. So why, why are we calling this era the era of data? Because of the way the data is presented now, most of the data is presented now. At some time uh, in the 80s or in the 90s, uh, big uh, workstations or computers were used mostly in the banking industry. And they have these like nice uh, spreadsheets that they uh, crunch the numbers on. And, and that's, that's what it was most of the times. Um, uh, so the data was very structured. So now we have a variety of data and this data is actually not very structured. And so that brings us into an opportunity and also a challenge. The opportunity being, uh, how do we extract information from the data? So data itself doesn't provide information. So you need to learn from the data. And for that, you need to work on, the, on it. And the second part is like then, uh, that, that brings us to, that, uh, to the question, is today's technology uh, sufficient enough to actually give us this intelligence from the data. And that's where the artificial intelligence came in the picture. And, uh, and this, this time, uh, there is so much uh, uh, you know, hype around the artificial intelligence because we are living in the age of the data. All right, so uh, let's, uh, let's look at the market potential of, uh, of artificial intelligence or um, I, I'm, I'm going to uh, describe why it's called neuromorphic computing. It is expected to grow about 20 to 30 uh, percent in by uh, 2025, and you can see that it it would expand across different domains, uh, starting from the mobile, consumer, computing, automotive, you name it. So there is a huge potential there, right? Okay. So um, I'm going to dive uh, a little bit deep here uh, uh, quickly. So what is basically, uh, how do we learn from this big data? Um, lots of, we have lots of data. So we come across different types of uh, artificial intelligence algorithms or machine learning algorithms. And in bro so software engineers look at these, uh, algorithms or models and they try to think about, okay, how we can make my model more uh, sophisticated. Uh, the hardware engineers the, uh, basically look at uh, how, in what platform should I be able to run these complex models or sophisticated models um, efficiently and fast but at the same time, allowing for the increase in the complexity of my models, right? So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm presenting this, uh, you know, cartoon uh, from the point of uh, hardware engineers. So in the broad uh, spectrum, we can think of uh, this, uh, the, the hard, you know, this hardware domain into two major segments. One is the conventional hardwares like the CPUs, the GPUs, the supercomputers, they all actually, uh, you know, be, being used for s solving these uh, machine learning problems. And then there is this huge uh, side, which is also part of the research, um, um, that what is the custom hardware that we can make. And within that custom hardware, uh, there is uh, opportunities to work at the system levels, so like, okay, we, we take all these uh, regular components um, like transistor, SRAMs, DRAMs, um, like the traditional digital computing elements and, and try to make it a better uh, architecture, better computer architecture. Or we can also think of even more fundamental ways. What, what, are, what should be my new memories are? Um, so that's, that, that's basically the niche within this custom hardware that basically looks at different types of uh, memory devices uh, and how we can use that. And 
there are so many jargons here. I'm going to, uh, you know, some of these jargons would be talked about in the later part. And um, from the point of view of algorithms, there are broadly two types of algorithms. One is uh, obviously conventional machine learning algorithms, where you have all these neural networks, deep neural networks. And um, there is biology-based models or biology-based algorithms. Uh, neural network, uh, the, the form of neural network is inspired from the way brain works, but it's not exactly mimicking uh, the biology of the brain or the learning paradigm of the brain. So there are certain uh, initiatives towards uh, actually mimicking the brain. So there are two types of algorithms or, or two types of uh, uh, what you say, applications. Um, so brain-inspired learning versus the artificial neural network. Uh, so the top figure, I'm showing how uh, a simple learning uh, paradigm that is called uh, spike timing dependent plasticity or STDP. And uh, this is actually a, a, a technique that, that, uh, that is used to describe some of the learning activities in the brain. And the, the idea is very simple. So you have accents, uh, so you have neurons and, uh, and two neurons are connected at the synapse. And um, there is a pre-synaptic pre neuron and then, then there is a post-synaptic neuron. So these neurons can send a spike. And depending on when this spike arrives at the synapse, I can uh, increase the connection strength of the synapse or decrease the connection strength of the synapse. So the idea is that uh, you have a bunch of synapses um, and uh, depending on when the pre-spike uh, pre arrives, is the pre-spike arrives uh, before uh, the post-spike, you increase the weight of the synapse. So you, you increase the connection and activity of the synapse. If the post-spike arrives uh, faster, then, uh, then you re reduce the, the connectivity of the synapse. So that's how, that's how actually it works. And you can actually mimic this entire uh, the way exactly this way and you can use that to learn something you you can use that to you know computer vision to like uh, uh, to to recognize images all right so that's a that's a work that has been done in our group of uh, well I was at Stanford uh, as a postdoc a while ago actually so this type of problem uh, this type of solution is very application specific this type of solution is uh, not very universal. The power of the computing uh, is that it's universality, it's ubiquity. And, and, and that's, been, that's been done by the digital logic. You know, you can solve any problems, uh, any arithmetic problems uh, by applying, just by a combination of simple gates, right? So people have been looking towards that uh, direction, like how can we actually generalize this problem solving ability. And that's where the neural network comes along. So neural network actually mimics the data flow of the brain, but it doesn't necessarily uh, emulates the learning inside the brain. And the technique is also similar, but it's not the same. So here we imagine the synapses to be a nodes and uh, sorry, synapses um, to be a nodes and then all these nodes have a weight of this synapse and the input is coming and this input is multiplied by the weight and there are multiple inputs all accumulated inside the neuron and then there is a non-linearity, okay? Uh, non-linearity meaning that if this signal is above a certain threshold, it would send uh, it would send a response. So that's it would send a response to the output. So that's where the uh, in the uh, artificial neural network that basically is the basis of of this inference and learning, both. So there is a neuron, and you have a bunch of inputs coming to the neurons, and they are uh, weighted by some weight factor W, 
and they basically go through a summation and a nonlinearity. So basically this thresholding mimics the firing behavior. So uh, just like in the uh, neurons and the synapses, if the synapse strength is above a certain threshold, this fires. Okay, so the post synaptic neuron fires in, in this forward direction. So that's the, that's the concept, but it's not exactly the same way that's, the, uh, that's done. And that, that is basically the uh, basis for all these deep neural networks. Uh, uh, that is out there. Most of these uh, convolutional neural networks or deep neural networks, this is basically the simple uh, paradigm uh, for that. And you can see that this is very easy to actually formulate in a mathematical form. form. So it's essentially a bunch of multiplication and bunch of additions. And there, there may be like one thresholding or, or nonlinear uh, response. And that's it. That's, that's it. And any neural network is... Uh, it can be operated in two phases. One is the learning, when, when we actually find the ways to solve a certain problem. That's what the learning is about. And then there is this called inference, which means that we have the weights now. Now I have a new input and I want to see the output. What, what is the output of this? So it's basically learning to actually recognize airplanes. So first I give, I feed my network with a bunch of uh, airplanes uh, pictures and it would learn that means it would uh, set some w's w uh, set of a w and then i have a new picture coming in and then it would say uh, whether my um, output is uh, whether it's an airplane or not that that's basically the whole structure but what i'm trying to say is that this learning and this inference both can be um, uh, sh shown uh, to, to, to be uh, forming the same type of mathematical models, um, just the multiplication and addition. The problem is that this is not very energy efficient. So this is an inferencing on the edge. Um, this, this term edge uh, say, says that, um, that you are doing this computation or intelligent computation, not in the cloud, but uh, at the, at the, that's why it's called edge, where, where the data is actually generated. So some decision making is possible. So it's basically a design of an in, intelligent drone. So the drone can, you know, it, it can navigate by itself. So it, it needs to take the decision based on its surroundings. So it, it needs some computer vision. And this type of inferencing actually is very power hungry. Um, and you can see. And even when, you, when we talk about the learning, um, and the learning, most of the learning is done at the uh, 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 level of, uh, at, the, at the clouds. And most of this uh, energy in the cloud is actually related to the energy and the thermal management. So that is a big component of the cost. So no matter what you do, whether you do it in the edge or you do it, go it in the cloud, it's always the bottleneck. So why there is this bottleneck? So we want to look at from this hardware point of view. So our main um, computing architecture is called the von Neumann architecture. It says that there is a compute element and there is this memory element and they are connected by bus. And traditionally it's, it's fine, uh, but the problem is when you have a big weight matrix, you have to store it in the memory. By saying memory, I'm, talking, I'm saying about, uh, think of it as a DRAM, um, okay? Uh, not the, the flash or hard drive, that's the storage, long-term storage. So there is this memory and I have to load these weights to the CPU first. And of course the CPU can actually also have memory that, that's called on-chip memory and that's mostly SRAM. And then I have to do the compute and I have to go uh, store it back to the memory. And this network paradigm that I showed you, in a typical network, there could be hundreds of, or, or there, would be, there could be tens of uh, layers. And each of these layers can have a lot of nodes. So you, you can imagine there could be like gigabytes of data that is just your weight matrix. So you need to have a large on-chip memory. And also these, uh, this memory needs to uh, come to the compute uh, element very fast, so you need to have a very large bandwidth. 
And uh, so that's what happens uh, these days. Uh, most of these energies is actually expended uh, by actually moving the memory back and forth rather than the compute because my compute element is now very fast. It can have multiple cores and whatnot. So the left figure shows um, what would happen if I want to perform some of these neural network models. Um, AlexNet, ResNet 150 language model at a state-of-the-art Intel CPU with eight cores and 128 gigabyte DRAM. Most of these energies is actually expended in the memory, uh, or uh, in other words, transfer, transferring the data back and forth from the, from the memory. So that's bad. Number two is that the bandwidth is not enough. Uh, right side, I'm, I'm showing how the, as, as my input image size increases, and I'm trying to solve a computer vision problem at different uh, uh, models, uh, I can see that the IO bandwidth increases significantly. And from AlexNet, AlexNet is kind of old, uh, ResNet is a few years ago old, and VGG is, is pretty new. These newer algorithms or newer models are even more data hungry. And so they need a lot of IO bandwidth. And this current hardware paradigm cannot actually provide these bandwidth. So this is a NV NVIDIA Tesla GPU with uh, four DRAM stacks, high bandwidth, still it's not enough if you just go above uh, 10 megapixels input image. So if you think about, okay, I'm going to do some image processing on my camera. So these days cameras are way above 10 megapixel easily. So forget about it. It's, it's not going to happen, at least in these today's, um, uh, today's hardware. So that, that's basically the challenge. The other, other challenge is the cache memory size. Um, so, the, so one of the other ways that we can solve that problem is that by increasing the amount of the cache. And you can see that the cache is not going to be enough. Even if, if you go forward, um, even if you increase the, uh, the scaling, you can at best get 3.8 gigabytes of memory at 1.4 nanometer node. That's an estimated number. And you can see that this uh, model accuracy of neural networks actually critically depend on this, uh, on the model size. So, so the cache memory will never be enough because it, it, it is too much area hungry. So one SRAM will need six transistors. So it's kind of, not doing uh, good. So what is the solution that people are still doing right now these days? So in order to solve the bandwidth problem, uh, people are trying to stack everything close to each other. So instead of having 2D integration, people are talking about the industry is going towards 2.5D. Here, there is this logic and there is this DRAM and they are connected on actually this, this type of package is called system on a chip where they are connected uh, through these micron size interposer, interposer layer, okay? So this provides, this brings the DRAM very close to the logic and increase the bandwidth. So these are high bandwidth memory. So this is one of the solution that people are doing and still it's not enough and uh, one of the other uh, option that industry is working on is to actually look at the problems of these neural networks and then uh, try to come up with intelligent ar architecture. So that's where the GPU comes along because all of these uh, neural network problems usually have similar types of data packet. So you can divide the data packet into multiple compute cores and each of these cores have, it, have its own cache and uh, have its own ALU. So increasing the number of cores is kind of what is being done in the GPUs. But GPU is very good for the similar type of data packet. It's not very good for dissimilar type of data packet. And that's where the multi-core CPU comes along. So that's the, that's the client side. For, for, the, for the data center side, there are also uh, high performing GPUs, which, which uses this type of uh, high bandwidth memory. So this is an NVIDIA chip with the GPU itself in the center, the side are all the high bandwidth memory. 
So this is in itself one chip. So this, this, this type of uh, system called system on a chip. Even this type of uh, things is very power hungry. So it consumes 250 watt and it can provide 900 gigabyte per second memory bandwidth. Still it takes five hours to train and rest that network. So imagine. And for the edge devices, for the mobile device like Apple uh, A11, they, ha they have the Bionic uh, on device uh, learning chip. Uh, so they can only do inferencing. So they don't do learning. So they, they are limited in application. This type of device is just, uh, this type of system is just a, a smaller version of a GPU. So maybe instead of like, like having more cores, they have less cores and that's, that's it. But these are, these solutions are not adequate. Why? Because the ultimate solution is that, um, the ultimate solution is going 3D. So my 2D uh, is, uh, is not sufficient. So I have to go up forward. So that, that's why actually Moore's law didn't say that the transistor size is going down. So this was Robert Dennard who actually came up with this uh, scaling theory that how you can increase the transistors in the, in the chip. Moore actually just said the transistor would be doubled and that's it. So Moore's law actually is not going dead. It's, it's going 3D. So this, is, this kind of system has been proposed by Stanford uh, and is being worked on. So this is like monolithic integration of um, logic and memory uh, with multiple levels of memory and uh, there are some compute elements and they are connected via like fine grained vias. So they will have massive connectivity. And simulation suggests that this type of system, monolithic 3D integrated system, can have uh, almost 1000x uh, system level uh, benefits. Uh, EDP means energy delay product benefits. So energy and delay, these are the two things that I talked about, the bandwidth and the, uh, and the energy. So in order for this to happen, there are different uh, types of technology enablers. And since I'm working for a materials company, we always look at where are the next new material uh, innovation opportunities. So we, we need to have like energy efficient logic. That's where the 2D materials come along. We need to have on-chip non-volatile memory, which are massive in size. So that's where all these emerging non-volatile memory comes along. And then we, we need to have this ultra grained, uh, no, sorry, fine grained 3D integration. And that's where all these interconnect materials, what kind of thermal uh, barriers we need to have. So that's where all these uh, innovation in, in terms of the materials comes along. All right. So um, now let's look at some of these emerging new memory uh, technologies that people have been looking into. Uh, these memories, the way they are, they can be integrated on top of the chip. They are not like SRAM. The idea is that they are uh, faster than flash, actually. Um, so they they can be used as memory, but they can be on chip. So that's the idea. So the left side is basically three technologies which are relatively more mature: uh, phase change memory or the PCM. For example, Intel actually has a product called Optane, which is 3D cross-point memory. And the memory element in the cross-point memory is a phase change memory, actually. And then there are, uh, so recently TSMC announced that they are offering RAMs, so resistive RAM, on their 40 nanometer node. Uh, so RAM is to some extent also being uh, utilized. And so uh, there are relatively newer technologies um, this is called ECRAM. ECRAM means electrochemical random access memory. Uh, so this works as um, having an, an insulator, which is a solid um, electrolyte where the ions can physically move. And, and this is a light ion, so it's lithium ion. So depending on the movement of the lithium ion, this acts as a gate and the threshold voltage between the source and drain changes. So you can actually change the channel conductivity. So this is also a newer technology. There is this uh, ferroelectric material. So ferroelectric materials uh, have permanent polarization 
what it does is that it can uh, it can also change the threshold voltage. So this these are all like three terminal uh, devices. These are essentially two terminal devices. Um, this is RM means resistive RAM, CVRAM means conductive bridge RAM. So the way RM works is that there is an oxide, typically a binary metal oxide, and you apply an electric field. Because of this electric field, there is a soft breakdown and the oxygen ions move and go to this oxygen reservoir. And this creates a vacancy path, oxygen ion vacancies, which is a highly conductive path. So depending on this, and this is called filament, and depending on the size of the filament, this can have a low conductive, uh, you know, high resistance state or the low resistance state. When the filament is broken, it's high, highly resistive state. Uh, the fi filament is not broken, it's low resistance state. So that's how it works. CBRAM is similar, instead of uh, relying on the oxygen ions, it uh, uses a special type of metal electrode where the metal diffusivity is much faster through this oxide. So actually, instead of going, the oxygen ions going out, the metal ions go in. So they are very similar to each other. I am going to talk about the phase change memory later, um, one of the work that I've been doing. So. I'm just gonna hold off on explaining what the phase change memory is because I'm going to uh, come back to phase change memory. All right, one last slide of the first segment that I want to talk about is that where this actually, where this memory uh, fall um, in, the, in, the, in the memory landscape. Uh, so we have, uh, at the core, we have different types of cache, L1 cache, L2 cache, L3 cache. They're all SRAM and they, they are fast, they're really fast. And then there is this DRAM, which is the main memory uh, of, this, uh, of, of my computer. And then the, there is the storage, which is my flash, my hard, hard drive. And so the storage is uh, slow, the speed is small. Uh, as we go along inside, uh, close to the cores, we get faster memory. So these memories are called storage class memories. The reason is that they are, typically non-volatile because up to DRAM, everything is volatile. So you turn off the power, you lose the memory, done. And um, the storage is just too slow. So these type of uh, memories are non-volatile, number one. Number two is that they can, they can be faster. Uh, so the, the push and research is being, how, how do we make it uh, faster uh, enough? How do we make it uh, you know, scalable enough? Those, those kind of things. So they actually are not that fast as, as an SRAM, but they would still be faster enough compared to DRAMs or other like L3 cache. So most of these uh, offerings, product offerings by let, let's say for example, TSMC actually is to replace the L3 cache. So one of the key uh, benefit of having a non-volatile memory in my cache is that I can reduce my standby power because I can turn off some of the, some of the segments and the data will still be there uh, when the, the device is not uh, working. All right, so that uh, brings to the end of my first part of my talk. Then I'm going to talk about one of the phase change memory project that I've been doing. And um, all right, if there is no question, I'm going to go forward. So uh, let's say, um, so first, how phase change memory works, what it is. So there are these uh, chalcogenide materials. So selenium, tellurium, these are chalcogenides. Uh, these materials are typically used uh, in making glass, actually. Um, these, are, these are called glass chalcogenides. And they actually change their uh, state, uh, phase. Phase meaning from crystalline to the amorphous. And they would transfer from being crystalline to amorphous us at relatively lower temperature. And you can provide this heat to change their uh, phase um, by supplying some current, some energy, some thermal energy. And that's the basis of the phase change memory is. And at the amorphous states, they are at high, highly resistive. At the, uh, at the crystalline state, they are very low resistive. So that's how you can differentiate your ones and zeros and you can have a memory. And the most common phase change memory material is germanium antimony telluride. 
and uh, germanium antimony telluride has a melting temperature close to 600 C. So you apply a pulse uh, high enough so that it would melt this thing, uh, the, the phase change material, and then you turn off your pulse very fast. So you quench it. As you turn off your pulse fast, this gets cooled down, but the, the atomic rearrangement is not possible so uh, to have it crystalline, so this becomes uh, amorphous material. In order to do the set, you have to bring the temperature at least up to the crystallization temperature, where the crystal, um, uh, you know, the atomic species can move to some extent, and you uh, turn off the pulse slowly so that it has enough time to actually rearrange themselves. So that's where, uh, uh, that's what the, the mechanism for phase change memory is. This is the most common uh, architecture of a phase change memory. So there is the phase change memory layer, and there is this top electrode. The bottom electrode looks like a small, like a, you know, small cylinder pipe, uh, because I need, I need a confined heating. If I make it too, too wide, this heater, then uh, I will need a lot of current to actually being able to you know, melt this thing. So that's why my heater is very confined. So this type of cell design is called a mushroom cell because it looks like a mushroom, right? So this is my switching re region. So that's where all these like uh, changing between amorphous to crystallization happens. Okay, uh, so that's basically my uh, phase change memory. So, Phase change memory actually requires a selector. A selector is just a gating device or a device that can that is volatile that that switches between um, really high resistance and really low resistance, right? So this selector acts as when whenever I want to select this device, I would use this selector, uh, and you know if the selector is turned off, that memory cell cannot be accessed. That's it. And so the selector, since these are two terminal material, I need a two terminal selector. I can use transistor as a, as a selector, but that would just, uh, you know, that would not serve the purpose of my scaling on, on chip. So these are some of these uh, die pictures from Samsung and Intel that shows these, uh, these memory layers that are actually on chip. So this is logic. And this is where the cells are, and this, these are the metal layers. So these are 3D integrated memory chip. This is Intel 3D cross point memory chip. All right, so all these things need a selector. And the problem is that that means selector needs to provide me the current that is required or the current density that is required to switch a phase change memory devices. The problem is phase change memory actually takes a lot of current especially during the reset process. As I showed to you, the, the, I need to reach at least to the melting point, right? So I need to actually increase the current so much so that it, it actually melts. Most of the selective, uh, most of these selector designs actually cannot provide uh, the amount of on-current density that is required by the phase change memory. So this, is, this becomes a limiting factor for the memory density. And one of the ways we can actually uh, you know, reduce the overall current is basically reducing the size of the heater. Uh, but the problem is that it increases the J as well. So it doesn't reduce the J necessarily. So that is basically the problem. Um, so the solution would be to reduce, uh, uh, solution would be to reduce the, the current that is required. And the way that is done is that to use some thermal confinement layer. So one of the technique is to use a thin layer of graphene, which has a very low or high uh, cross plane thermal resistance or low thermal conductivity. And it basically um, it can reduce the reset current. Okay, so the name of the game for, uh, for this type of interfacial engineering is that we need to generate as much heat as possible with expending as low current as possible. We need to generate the heat close to the, the switching material and we need to avoid the heat loss. So this type of technique with the graphene just only avoids the heat loss and that's all. Now we 
um, recently I came up with this idea and I also work with one of uh, other fellow Buetian um, uh, when I was a postdoc and uh, at Stanford. That's where I came uh, up with this idea is that, hey, how about we can uh, utilize the thermoelectric heating? Because there is this Joule heating, which depends on the I square R. There is this Peltier heating, which is the opposite of the Seebeck effect. And that tells us that if every, um, so if we have two different materials form a junction and two junctions have two different temperatures, um, then I will have an electromotive force between these junctions. That's the thermoelectric effect. That's called Seebeck effect. The opposite is called Peltier effect. Is that if I have an electromotive force or the current uh, through a junction, which have different Seebeck coefficient, I will have a heating depending on the difference of the Seebeck coefficient. So GST has a Seebeck coefficient, uh, moderate Seebeck coefficient to 40 to 100 microvolts per Kelvin. And bismuth telluride is another thermoelectric material which has relatively large negative Seebeck coefficient. So you can have really high delta S. And actually this, this, is, this is the, uh, the main technique that people use for making thermocouples, right? Or thermoelectric, uh, you know, thermoelectric generators, electricity generators. So the opposite effect. So we took that we took that idea and we implemented that here. It's shown here with the 50 nanometer GST with the four nanometer bismuth telluride. And uh, this is our first, first device. And we were able to see a very significant reduction in the, in, the, in the reset current. So this is basically low resistance state. This is high resistance state. We can, uh, you know, we see that this transition happens at much lower temperature when there is a bismuth telluride. And this process is also scalable. As we scale down the bottom electrode or the heater diameter, we can also see the current um, and goes down. So that is very encouraging. And one of the things that we need to see that the current is basically reduced, what about the voltage? Or what is the voltage that is needed? So we see that the voltage is also reduced. So it, it means that the heating is coming from the, the, the heating, Peltier heating, and not from the additional series resistance that is, that is added by the bismuth telluride. In fact, bismuth telluride is so thin that the series resistance um, is not a big issue. Um, so we see ultimately a 2x power reduction here in the bismuth telluride. And this, this device is very stable, and we can switch these devices back and forth between low resistance state to the high resistance state up to 10 to the power five cycles without, uh, without any failure at room temperature. Now the question is, uh, is, the, is the thermoelectric effect really the, the, the issue that is actually causing this improvement or there is something else? There could be the fact that this almost seems like an interfacial layer and so this, this would add some thermal boundary resistance. Would that actually impact uh, this, uh, uh, the, the, the reduction in the reset current? We saw that, the, uh, first we proved that this is indeed a thermoelectric effect. One proof, a very simple proof between uh, differentiating Peltier heating and thermo, uh, Joule heating is that Joule heating is um, polarity independent. So Joule heating is always I square R. So it doesn't matter whether you change the polarity of your current, whereas Peltier heating is actually dependent on the polarity of the current. Um, so if you change the polarity, heating would become cooling and the other side would become, uh, would start heating. So we see significant change, significant degradation if we reverse the polarity of the current. Um, we can see the uh, significant change in the reset process. Whereas when we do that for the simple devices where there is no bismuth telluride, uh, we don't see as much difference as we were expecting to, uh, we were seeing in the bismuth telluride devices. So this suggests that this is indeed a thermoelectric heating. Moreover, we have uh, measured the thermal boundary resistance at this interface with the bismuth telluride and without the bismuth telluride. We see that the, the difference is very small. All right, and then finally, we want to actually uh, 
benchmark this device where are, are we um, uh, you know sitting in terms of uh, other devices that are reported we we see that we have a significant reduction in the reset current density um, and this is on par with even the the confined cell uh, design so as i said these are the mushroom cell and uh, in order to actually confine the heat there are other techniques that people have worked on one of the technique is that uh, if i go back here uh, instead of having this gst layer all the way you basically start confining this this region by some dielectric which is low thermal conductivity so that adds to the more uh, process complexity so you need more little steps you need more etching steps so that's that's a that's a problem uh, with respect to that this technique is very scalable because it's just a, a, just a new material and already it can beat the confined cell structure there are some recent uh, uh, devices which are super lattice structure phase change memory this this is this is a different class of memory so that's different but at least with us the mushroom cell kind of structure this uh, bismuth telluride is much more uh, you know effective in reducing the reset current density and bismuth telluride is just one material and there are so many other and it's not the most optimized material so there are so many opportunities in finding the different materials um uh, to actually you know see what kind of um, reset current reduction we can we can get and um the idea is that the larger the difference between the seebeck coefficient the the, the more um uh, bell shear effect we will see and that will reduce the reset current even more with that i would like to end and thank you all for listening um so now i would like to um answer the questions i think uh, i think i should open the floor and um, first i i'm going to read some questions from here that i found is there any difference between basic working principle between ecram and rm what i understand is that ecram is a three tunnel device with chart changing concentration of lithium ions inside the channel while rms have two tunnel devices that explore change concentration yes there is actually um there is a significant um difference actually let me go back to that slide um to see what is the difference there is significant difference number one this is a reaction uh, you know this is a soft breakdown process in the oxide the oxygen ions move here there is an actually lithium reservoir and this is a diffusion of lithium inside inside this oxide it looks a little bit like cbram but um this requires a very sophisticated um uh, solid state um uh, solid state uh, electrolyte and most of the solid state electrolytes actually work slightly high temperature so the key is to find the right solid state electrolyte where the uh, where uh, where the metal ions can move faster so that that's one of the key structural difference and the uh, and the other difference is that the response so it's shown that this uh, ec ram can actually switch between low lowest resistance state to the highest resistance state very gradually so you are not just bound by a binary memory you can have an analog memory so i didn't really bring in the concept of the analog memory but that's also another concept today today i didn't bring that for the sake of time so but this is this fits very well within that that region that's why it's it's it, it has got so much so much interest all right is there any way to all right one more question i think is there any way to increase or reduce the area of the switching region is there any effect of switching area changing area of switching region on time it takes for reset and set yes that's true um there is a way to increase or reduce the area of the switching region um well two ways one is to actually reduce the i i am guessing you are talking about the phase change memory if if it is you can actually uh, change the area of the heater 
there are lots of different other techniques uh, that people are trying to do uh, without even going to the you know to the lithographic limit uh, trying to actually reduce the area by actually putting a liner material which which is kind of high highly resistive so the current will essentially be focused towards towards here so that's that's the way that you can reduce the switching region the other technique is to make a confined cell so essentially keep the phase change material not everywhere just on top of the uh, of top of the heater region that's the only region and is there any effect of changing area of switching region on time it takes for reset and set yes it, it definitely has uh, has an effect um, so in general the smaller my switching area switching region the, the smaller my switching time is but then if i my switching area is too small the, the trade-off is that i will have um, lower on and off ratio so the resistance window that that the switching is happening is going to reduce right because i have less materials so when i'm doing the read of these memories i i just measured the resistance of this thing so if this thing is very thin i can you know thin down the phase change material no problem but the problem is you will not have enough window of between low resistance state and high resistance state okay some more questions you mentioned that your device fails after no i no, actually, the device doesn't fail after five cycles. Uh, that's what I said. I think I, I wasn't probably very clear. The device was still working after 10 to the power five cycles. Uh, we haven't gotten the chance or the time duration to actually cycle it until it fails. So we don't really know how many cycles it can do yet. So, and uh, why it fails and what is the mechanism for failure? Actually, um, any phase change material fails um, um, in terms of the endurance because of this movement of these uh, germanium, antimon germanium antimony ions. So these, especially the germanium ions are very uh, mobile and sometimes they create voids by doing the movement long, long time. So the, those are the mechanisms for failure. The other thing is that the titanium nitride is actually an active material because titanium is a very um, reactive material. So sometimes uh, the germanium uh, actually goes inside uh, inside the titanitride layer and forms the titanium germanite. So that's also you know cause the failure. So then you don't see that uh, switching window. How is the interface between bismuth telluride and GST? Is there any addition problem or something like that as the endurance of the? Yeah. Um, is there any segregation? We haven't done those studies. Uh, the, there is no addition problem. So that I can tell there is no delamination or anything. Um, that the endurance is not uh, 10 to the power five cycles. We, we, we have shown up to 10 to the power five cycles, but it can be switched even more. Um, and we don't really, we, we haven't really done enough in this area uh, to actually study all these things so this is a relatively new work and still evolving um so that's basically the answer any other questions regarding anything so okay pcm devices can be modeled using final element console do you have any specific recommendation regarding simulation work on pcms yes simul uh, pcm devices can be modeled using finite element modeling method um um any specific recommendations well actually uh i have done i have done some modeling work as well i'm not i haven't shown shown it here um on the pcm myself what i found is that the comsol what i found is challenging is to actually simultaneously model the the phase change and the temperature and that's where a lot of things can be done. Uh, those, those type of uh, coupled modeling. Like uh, most of these models are just uh, to explain one or two experimental results. So they either look at the electrothermal, electrothermal part of it or they look at the ion movement part of it. But, but I haven't seen too much work uh, you know, connecting these two. So that could be a very interesting work if someone could do it. But it's actually challenging, more challenging than, you know, then it sounds. 
um, I have several questions. Would you please tell me why bismuth telluride is covered other than GST heater interface? My second question is, okay, why bismuth telluride is covered? Okay, um, yeah, we could have done that. Mm. We could have done uh, not covering, um, covering the whole region instead of just covering on top of it, but it would add like more complexity and um, and and this heater electrode's uh, diameter is actually much smaller. It's like, it's a hundred nanometers. So it's very hard to do the litho there. And um, doing that would not solve too much of a problem because bismuth telluride actually is very resistive because it's only four nanometers. So there is no lateral electrical conduction. So my mushroom size would not grow too much. So that's basically one of the questions. Second question is, would you please explain the advantages of using bismuth telluride as a selector other than transistor or resistors and so on? Third one. I'm not sure I understand the question uh, using bismuth telluride as a selector. So bismuth telluride is not a selector. Bismuth telluride doesn't switch. It's just, um, it's just making the heating efficient. That's, that's one of the third one. Would you please give us some guidance to do some research on this memory technology, for example, PCM? Um, I, okay. Um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a more involved question. I don't think I can you know, answer like generally about those things. Uh, one thing is that PCM is already getting very mature. I can tell you that. Um, the room for improvement in the PCM doing work is getting narrower day by day. That's, that's a problem. And so people are moving towards the super lattice kind of PCM or IPCM. So I would suggest you start looking there if you really want to work there because that, that part is still very new. So, and if you, if you have any specific research question, we can you know, take it um, you know, personal chat. All right, any other question? I don't see any other question. You can, you don't have to write the question. You can also like ask if you like with the voice. Any comment on retention of the devices? That's a good question actually. Yeah, we haven't done that retention study. Um, let's see uh, what the reviewers ask. Maybe the reviewers would ask the retention study and we have to do that. Um, it's a relatively new work. Honestly, uh, what are the target applications for this type of PCM devices as front runners like Intel and ST microelectronics, mostly focus on automotive applications. You know, um, the target applications for this type of PCM devices is essentially a fast on-chip memory. Uh, that was the basic um, basic application. Now, whether the chip would be used in automotive that's a different question. So, you know, automotive has a different set of uh, requirements. It needs to operate at high temperature. It has like high reliability uh, requirement. But other than automotive, there are a lot of other places where you really need, um, really need on-chip memory. Um, for example, all these like uh, virtual reality glasses. And you really can't have too much temperature increase in there. So you need like really energy efficient memory there. Um, otherwise no one will wear that in front of their eye if that gets hot like a computer, right? So that's, that's a big application I can see. ECM GTO is working first, the right operation or second read operation. What is the working principle here? I could not hear anything for system condition. Oh, I'm so sorry that you could not hear it. Uh, for ECRAM, um, the, the working principle is that the write is done by the gate and the source. Um, the electric field basically moves the lithium ion from the interface of lithium, uh, you know, the reservoir and the tungsten oxide. Uh, that, and the tungsten oxide is a semiconductor that works as a channel. And when we do the read, we read the source and drain. And depending on the concentration of uh, lithium ions at the interface, um, the threshold voltage 
is going to change. And so you would see different conduction, conductivity uh, that you can measure between the source and drain. And that's how, um, that's how the ACDM works. <clears throat> All right, so, okay, I can see that there is no other question at this moment. Um, yeah, um, if not, I think we can end this session. So Sajid, I want to, you know, well, thank you so, so much, uh, Raisul, for uh, coming today. And uh, before we conclude, I would like to ask everyone for a group photo. So if you're comfortable, please uh, go ahead and um, to turn on. Sure, your I can video. turn on. I can turn on my video. Sure, sure, okay. no problem. And I think um, let me. Uh, just a second. How do I turn? Let's let me first. Uh, okay, yeah, I know how to do that. Start the video. And uh, thank you so much, everyone, for uh, com coming today. I see a lot of our uh, old uh, students uh, here as well. And uh, I see uh, Dr. Mainul from Dhaka University. He's uh, among us. And uh, a lot of the graduate students of uh, Buet, they also came today. Right. Uh, let me take the screenshots. Okay, uh, I'm all done. And uh, thank you so much, Raisul. It was really nice to hear the talk and learn about all the uh, different uh, technologies of uh, memory that is, are there. So I guess uh, if that- Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. And, thank you so uh, much for inviting me. Thank you everyone for listening. Okay. And if it is okay with Raisul, uh, I'll share the recording with him first. And if it's okay with him, I'll, I'll then uh, upload it into our YouTube channel. So with okay. this, uh, sure. I would like to uh, conclude uh, today's session and thank you for joining thank us. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye.